السلام عليكم ورحمة الله تعالى وبركاته. وعليكم السلام. الحمد لله. I was I wanted to be worried before I began that we didn't really discuss how we split up the topic. But then I remembered a good friend of mine who was going to be here but he couldn't make it, Imam Afroz Ali. And we do a lot, we've done a lot of programs together. He said, don't worry about it. Since many times we speak, it's okay, how are we going to split up the topic? He said, don't worry about it. Allah makes things fit together. Right? It always happens. Um, SubhanAllah. And so what Mr. Abdul Latif mentioned really hit at, at the heart of what the causes of, of extremism are, especially this you know this idea that you know the what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has blessed us with through the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam when Allah Himself describes it as being a light. That has become to you from Allah a light. What is light? Light is that which gives clarity. It shows you things as they are. And the, the believer, you know, someone who has Iman, what does Iman do? Iman, faith, is believing in things as they truly are. And the truest reality is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself. And what has come to us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And the cure for the confusions that lead to you know, to extremism and, and what you can call ugly Islam. That does exist. There's things, you know, there's a simple criteria. And often Muslims do strange and disturbing things, but if you ask one simple question, can you imagine the Prophet ﷺ doing that? And anytime the answer is no, then it's very simple. It's not Islam. Right? Because Islam is what the Prophet ﷺ came with. And however, that clarity, where is it found? That clarity is found in knowledge. And I wanted to touch upon, upon this issue of, of extremism with, with respect to the community itself. Because as believers, we are individuals and we're a community. For the, for the individual, that clarity in one's life, right, that mercy in, in one's life, is to connect with knowledge. And, you know, I've recently realized, and some of the MCC administration, we were talking, um, and many people are self-conscious about being referred to as uncle. Right? But I decided to be pragmatic about it. I said, look, I'm, I'm an uncle already. I'm not 40 yet, but I'm getting there. So I've just declared myself to be Uncle Rabani. You know, before others call me uncle, I'll embrace uncleness. So I actually have a Twitter handle called Uncle Rabani, <laughs> who is you know, the, the wise Indian uncle. Right? But, you know, and uncles always tell me, Beta, I told you so. Right? You know, I told you this. I remember I told you that years ago. Right? And I'm beginning to feel that because you know people keep coming and they you know ask the same thing again and again. But one of the things before we talk about the community at the level of the individual is, and if you're honest with yourself, you may experience this: that a lot of people, a lot of Muslims, are scared of knowledge because we have an apprehension towards knowledge in that we feel that if we learn more about the Deen, it's going to make things difficult for us. And the reality is that this is completely wrong. Because the Prophet ﷺ told us, Inna truly this religion is ease. That any true understanding of a deen, what does it bring into one's life? It brings ease into one's life. But what is ease? And what is ease? And subhanAllah, I've been looking like, what is a good definition of yus, of ease? And many ulama had many things to say about it, but the best explanation that I heard about it was by one of the great blessings of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to this age, Shaykh Muhammad Sayyid Ramadan al Buti. And the ulama would say that if 
Ibn Malik, the author of the Alfiya in grammar, a thousand line poem in grammar, he said that if knowledge is divine gifts right, and lordly facilitations, then it is not surprising if Allah saves for later scholars of knowledge that he did not inspire her earlier scholars to. And you find this, that it is from the mercy of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you, know, you can go and research an issue in many, many places, but you find that a contemporary scholar explains something in ways that no one before him or her explained it. Why? Because this is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Inspiration is from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That he wanted the Hanafi fuqaha, basing this upon what Ibn Malik said, He's praising his own book. He says, فَمَنْ ظَفَرَ بِمَا فِيهِ فَسَيَقُولُ بِمِنْهِ فِيهِ كَمْ تَرَكَ الْأَوَّلُ لِلْآخِرِ That if someone attains what is in this book of mine, they will say with a full mouth, how much did the earlier scholars leave for the late scholars? So Shaykh Al-Qulti explained, and I'm not doing full justice to what he said, that ease is not simply making things easier for you in life. Ease is understood in, in our deen that religion is ease, that religion is the means to ultimate ease. Right? Because true ease is ease that lasts, which is the eternal ease. But the religion lays out a path to the eternal ease that itself is characterized by ease in this life. But it's an ease that has perspective. Right? Which is a point that, you know, Salah Abdul Latif emphasized, that that balance it right, gives you a sense of direction. So the horizon by which we look at things is, is this is a means to eternal ease. So even if it were difficult right now, even if it were, which it, it is not, it's a means to eternal ease. But the characteristic of it in this life is, is ease as well. And we should not hold back from seeking knowledge out of that baseless fear. Because I find it all the time. People, we, we run an answer service, and daily, people make their deen much more difficult for themselves than it is. Why? Because they don't gain knowledge. <coughs> so there's people at work who spend 10 minutes doing wudu at work. And they find wudu difficult and prayer difficult. Whereas the Prophet wasallam, you see the description of his wudu. And one of the ulama pointed this out. If you go step by step, look, take the hadiths of the Prophet about wudu, and do each of those steps as described, and they're described in detail in the hadith of Sayyidina Uthman radiallahu and others, it doesn't take more than a minute or, minute, minute or two. That's it. Why? Because that's the characteristic of balance in the prophetic path. It is virtuous, but it is characterized by this ease and straightforwardness. So one of the ways to get that clarity in, in one's own life is to seek knowledge. A lot of the intellectual confusions that people have are dispelled sometimes actually just by one verse in the Qur'an, and by one word in the Qur'an. And a lot of people have doubts about who is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Just look at the tafsir of Allah al-Saman. Allah is the independent whom all are dependent upon. And if you understand that one word, because that's how Allah describes Himself, that will give you clarity and dispel all confusion about who is God and all kinds of misplaced notions about God. So we should not haste, we should not hesitate to seek that knowledge, but to seek it in that way of balance. But if we look at it as a community, it is undeniable that there are people within our community who have troubling understandings and who are doing things that are ugly and disturbing. But it is also a reality that if you see case after case of these things happening, these don't happen from within our community in the sense that typically the people who engage in those kinds of ugly actions or who are led to engage in those actions, they're not typically coming from within the community. They either stepped away from the community or were estranged from the community or were never even part of a Muslim community. Right? So we can take one approach to that, which is saying we're not responsible. As a community, we did not cause these things to happen. But 
what, we sh what should cause us to pause is that what is our religious duty as individuals in a community? And that if we are part, and you're not just part of the community if you're in the leadership of the community. Because the religious duties we have as a community, they're, they're considered communal obligations. Furud al kifaya they, they fall upon everyone in the community. So the responsibility of fulfilling the religious duties that this center, for example, the MCC has, they don't fall on the administration. That the administration is responsible for fulfilling the mandate that MCC has. It falls upon the entire community. These are representatives of that community. But they don't absolve the community of that responsibility. But we have to remember that all the religious responsibilities that we have are towards the entirety of the community. And we have responsibilities as a community that is in the context of a society. But we have to ask ourselves that are we conveying that clarity, that light, that mercy, that good, that beauty, that virtue, that radiant way that we know the Prophet ﷺ has come with, that has given our own lives beauty and meaning and good, which cause us to be connected with our masjid, with our institutions, that causes us to support the, the various worthy projects that are there in the community. And you're blessed in the, in the Bay here to have some of the foremost projects in, in the Muslim Ummah if we really realize it, projects like Zaytuna, for example, and so many other no noble projects that cause us to support these projects. But have we reached the Muslim community with that, with that which we have? And the reality is that we haven't. Right? The reality is that we haven't. So it is not surprising that people will get confused. Right? That in seek in seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but unguided by knowledge, lacking the clarity that we all, I'm sure, feel that Allah has blessed us with. And there's many people out there who don't have that. And it is not surprising that they stumble into extremes. Many of them stumble into extremes just in their own daily lives. And some of you may have experienced that. A natural thing that happens when someone becomes religious at the personal level is that if you are trying to seek the pleasure of Allah in your religious practice, what are you going to try to do? Are you going to try to take it easy? No. You're, you're going to try to be careful. But how can you be careful if you don't know where the limits are? So on a daily basis, the most common questions we get on Seeker's Guides, we get dozens of questions a day, have to do with wudu. People lead miserable lives because of wudu. Why? There's people who spend hours a day in the washroom. And you may think it's funny, but it's real. There's people who give up religious practice because of wudu. There's people who give, give up on the deen. Why? Even though wudu is so simple. But they don't have that clarity. They don't have that clarity. There's people who are lost in confusion about very simple things that are non-issues for us as believers because of the environment they grew up in. That although people are, you know, are going away from faith, but the social and cultural environment we live in instills in even us as believers notions about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, about God, that the thinking person could never accept. So there's so many Muslims who wonder that if Allah if God is, if Allah is good, then how can they be evil in this world? And there's people who leave the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala because of this issue. That for us as believers is a non-issue. It's a non-issue because we don't define God in human terms. We don't say that Allah must do the good. Because what is the good? Who determines the good? It's a very simple issue. Of course, we don't, you have to be careful when the Christian person asks you, is God good? Don't say yes and don't say no. Because not every question has a yes or no answer. Not every question has a yes or no answer. We say that Allah is the determinant of good and, good and evil. And, and 
Allah determines what's right and wrong. And nothing puts limits on Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Rather, everything that Allah does has wisdom. Everything that Allah does has wisdom. And it, it's part of the reality of by which Allah created this earth, with, which is in order to test you, which of you is best in words. We understand that there's a hereafter. Right? So no one will be wronged even an atom. So someone, a little child who died in, in a tsunami, we're not troubled by that. Why? Because we know that there's a hereafter. That everyone will get what they deserved. And Allah will deal with His creation on the basis of mercy. So for us, this is not an issue. But lacking knowledge, people are deeply troubled. This is why, like one of the great poets of the 20th century, Kiyas he said, most people lead lives of quiet desperation. But within our community, most Muslims lead lives of quiet desperation about their deen. Why? Because they have these nagging doubts. They have these confusions. They know that the Messenger of Allah came with the most beautiful and life-giving of messages. But what they perceive of it and hear about it appears to be disturbing and ugly and confused and confusing. Now we can sit back and say, well, tough. You know, I have something of the good, and alhamdulillah, you know, we recite, you know, the, the, the will of Shaykh Abu Bakr bin Salim, and we're fine, and you know, that's it. But we have a communal obligation, a farm kifaya, right? That none of you believes until they wish for others of the good as they wish for it themselves. And this is something that would keep the Prophet ﷺ awake at night. This is something that he would be sitting, reflecting about. What would benefit his ummah and how to convey the good to his ummah. And it's something that should trouble us, whether we're part of the, you know, part of the leadership of various projects that we're involved in, whether the community institutions or various projects, but it should also concern us as individuals. Right? That if you come to a typical Muslim event, you should think about the BHI. Do you know what the, do you know what the BHI is? Do anyone know what the BHI is? Okay. The BHI is a Beard Hijab Index. <laughs> and at a typical religious program, the BHI, the Beard Hijab Index, is above 85 or 90%. Right? And I'm sure most of the men didn't grow their facial hair, even in partial, midweek. It's been there for a while. Whatever, however much it is. Right? And there's gauges by which you can tell that you know, it appears most sisters are of those who wear hijab. Now, is that the reality of the broader Muslim community? No. So where are those people? Where are those people? And the, the, the nature of our deen is our deen is a sticky deen. And our deen is a sticky deen. That people remain connected with it, even when you wouldn't imagine that they would remain connected with it. I grew up and I went through what I would now consider an extreme phase when I was at university, and I used to wonder about some of my family members. Is he still a Muslim? Right. But one of my relatives, his mother died, and he called me. At that time I was in Jordan. So okay, my mother died, and I thought he was not Muslim. I didn't see him pray. I didn't think he took, he took time off for Eve. I was like, okay, two strikes, one more strike, and I'm going to sort of have to consider him Catholic. <laughs> you know, like I was, you know, wanted to be just. But alhamdulillah, I was too lazy to, to take extreme stances. Because extremism requires some energy. Uh, but alhamdulillah for the. But it was, you know, but the nature of the deen is, it, it sticks. Because what, what the base of the deen is, La ilaha illallah, Muhammad Rasulullah. It sticks with people. But when they have that, inc that inclination to return to it, how can they do so? How can they do so? We have to be very concerned about the 80% of the Muslim community, the 90% of the community that doesn't come to our institutions. And most of them, most of them, you'll find surprising levels of religious concern amongst them. But yet they can't imagine themselves being part of our religious institutions. So we have to have an active concern. And it's not about how many people come to your institution. 
how many people are in your program? But have we done our utmost best to reach out to those seeking guidance? Have we really called them? Have, and then it's not just about calling them, but if they have come to our institutions, our programs, our projects, have they felt welcome? Have they felt welcome? And that is, that is critical, because if we don't take care of that, there'll be even greater confusion in the broader Muslim community. It's already a reality right, that there are a lot, of people, a lot of Muslims right here in North America who have been leaving the deen. Atheism. I have first cousins who are atheists who won't give me, who won't return. And some of them, you know, I respect them for it because it's based on reason. It's misguided, inshallah, they'll come back. But who won't return my salams? Because they say, I don't believe, so why should I give you a religious greeting? I'm like, okay, well, you know. But this is a reality. And there's others who harbor deep doubts. What is the cure for it? We need to reach out to them that if we feel that we have something of benefit, we shouldn't feel content to simply be a club of the, the BHI, the bearded and hijabi, right? you know, bearded hijabi Islamics, and not Islamists, but Islamics. Right? No, we have to have a broader concern. But to do that, how can we reach out to those people? That knowledge, that guidance, that that spiritual connection that we feel we have. The first thing is we have to take it very seriously to be living embodiments of it. That regardless of how, whether you feel yourself worthy or unworthy, you are an ambassador of Allah and His Messenger in your own family, in your own society, to your own children, right? To your own children. How do you call your own children to the deen? You don't call them by your words. You call them by your conduct and state. But then to the broader society, right? to the broader society, now we have to have an active concern to look at how our religious programming, how our educational programs, how our institutional projects are reaching out to and serving and being accessible and relevant to the broader community. To the, and that should be an active concern. We should be sitting together and thinking about plans. That, look, this is our responsibility. Are we reaching them? And not to judge on false scales that, well, Alhamdulillah, we packed this place. But who did, we, who did we pack it with? With friends and family. That's good. But that's not a fulfillment of our responsibility. But you can feel down about that. That, you know, that's such a big responsibility. But in reality, this is a tremendous blessing. The Prophet ﷺ said that whoever reminds my sunnah in a time of tribulation or confusion in my ummah has the reward of martyrs. In some narrations, a hundred martyrs. But the stronger narration has the reward of a martyr. Why? Because consider what you're doing. You are facilitating guidance for others. We could have lived a hundred years ago in a place like Damascus, and even if you're a scholar, you were redundant. There are so many other scholars. Even now, in cities like Damascus, may Allah return it to, to, to safety and well-being, there's many, many great people of knowledge who did not feel the need to teach. Or they only had a handful of students. Why? But there's so many scholars out there already. But now, if you are someone who takes your religion seriously, there are so many opportunities to reach out to others. There's, and we're going to be closing with it. There's one sister, for example, who just studied for less than a year. She just studied two basic texts on, on the fifth of worship. But what did she do with it? She learned it well. And in the last nine years, she's taught at least 1,200 people. She, only st she didn't go overseas to Damascus or Tarim or here or there. She just studied a basic text of, in how to pray and then a mid-sized text. Total not more than 35, 40 classes. But she did it really well with a concern to act upon it herself. She, she's a serious person of being. People in her community ask that, you know, we want Sister So-and-so to teach. She said, I'm not worthy. But so they asked her teachers. And I was one of the two people who taught her. And both of us knew her because she, she was an active, serious student. Both said, no, she should teach. And she's been teaching since. Not as some Shaykh al Islam, as a khidmat. And she's been in different communities across the U.S. She's taught at least 1,200 people. Right? And, and this is something that is a tremendous opportunity. That even if you learn a little, and you strive to act upon it, and in the context of community, and in consultation 
with the teachers that you have. That you don't just go and say, I'm going to start teaching. No. You have scholars in this community. You have leaders in this community. You have institutions in this community. Connect with them. Right? And look, Allah may open for you the door of teaching. Someone else, Allah may open the door for reaching out to the youth. Someone else, Allah, the door that He's opened for you is to counsel other people. Someone else, Allah has opened the door for you to be assisting those who are engaged in those things. But we should take this as a tremendous gift that Allah has placed us in times where we can be vehicles for conveying that prophetic light or assisting in the conveyance of that prophetic light or at least in being supporters of that prophetic light. So what should we do? Right? It's called the kiss of life. Right? And we're going to close with it. There's four things. Right? Four things by which we sustain religion in our own lives and that we should be coming together as a community to reach out first to the broader community of Muslims and then to the society that we're in. Right? To, to exemplify the prophetic method, the kiss of life is that we, we need to be connected with and supporting knowledge in the way of knowledge, inspiration, spirituality, and service. We need to have knowledge, and we should always be supporting the you know the spread of knowledge in our own community institutions, whether our, our mosques or the the institutions that are emerging now in North America for the spread of knowledge. But knowledge on its own is not enough. We need religious inspiration, that which will cause us to live that knowledge. And there's many means to that that we won't detail. We need to bring that knowledge to its full fruition through having a living spirituality. Through remembrance and gathering in the ways of spiritual growth. And the fourth thing that we have to have is we have to have a spirit of service. That in order to have sincerity in your own practice of deen, there should be some element of service in which you are serving others in whichever way of service that Allah facilitates for you, but with consistency, with concern, with others, so that you're doing it in jama'ah, in a group, because Allah's hand is with the group. <coughs> and if we do these four things, not just both in our individual lives, but together as a community, we'll find that our deen will flourish, and we will spread the light of clarity, right? by which the tendency to be confused and misguided will lessen in our time. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make us see this tremendous opportunity. And we shouldn't feel down. Because we don't choose the times that Allah has placed us in, but we can choose our response. And this is a tremendous gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that we can rise up and seek to be of those who live the call of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in our own lives and who call others to that, either through our own calling or through our assistance or support and concern for that call towards the light of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. وَمَنْ أَحْسَنُ قَوْلًا مِمَّنْ دَعَى إِلَى اللَّهِ And who is better in speech than the one who calls to Allah? And that's both the one who's engaged in the calling and the one who's assisting them and serving them and supporting them. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that concern both in our own individual lives and as a community. And to see that we have a tremendous responsibility before us. And we should not sell ourselves short and come and volunteer. Right? And we should also look at how we can structure our organizations in our community to be able to make the most of the resources and the human potential that exists in our communities. That we cannot afford to structure under our institutions in primitive ways that do not make the most of the tremendous talent and potential that exists in our communities. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala inspire us to that good and that may he, may he grant us high aspirations and high hopes and make us committed to uphold excellence in all that we do and that we rely upon him so that we find the fruition of our highest of aims in the most noble of ways. Please, sisters, feel free. First one. Please, go ahead. I have a question, maybe it's not related, but I like the topic of uh, the middle way, not extreme women. I missed your lecture, unfortunately, I just came. So I have this question about uh, how the groups, you know, the people, they leave. Uh, 
doing data for four months, three months. Is that? I don't think that makes any sense to abandon your family, leave them, and the schools. So the question is about certain groups that you know people go for several months, yeah. leaving their family, etc. Um, there, there's in itself. There's a basis for people going out and calling people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But there's also, of course, the consideration that one must take care um, of both the you know the financial needs of the family and also their, their social needs and so on. So if it's done correctly, this is one way of calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And typically, if we see the scholars from such groups they, they strongly encourage people that if they do so, that they do so in a manner in which both the financial and human needs of the family are taken care of, etc. But what sometimes happens is that there's people who go beyond those limits. And they get very exuberant. They hear the talk at the masjid and they're like, I'm off tomorrow. Um, so it's not fair to necessarily you know, ascribe those excesses of individuals necessarily to a group. And the matter is vast, right? The, the matter is vast. Um, there's there are many different approaches to calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yeah, different people find different levels of comfort and benefit. And however, you know, we know that anything that results in harm, you know, all things considered is not consonant with prophetic teachings. And the, the way of the Prophet ﷺ is the way of perfect balance. The Prophet ﷺ said, give, and It's not give, give every person who has a right. Give all who have rights their due rights. Because the dihaq there refers not just to human beings, but give everything and everyone who has a right their due rights. And that's the sense of perfect balance. So it's not a question of, should someone go on da'wah or take care of their family? The right balance is how do you, the, the right, the prophetic way is, how do you give your family their rights? And your, your da'wah or your studies or your service or your activism, their rights. And to come up with the perfect, with the right balance in those things. And if someone's inclined to those kinds of ways, one of the things that all of us can do when we're trying to make our choices is to consult. Is to consult. It is sufficient for us to know that the Prophet himself is the greatest intellect that Allah Taala ever created, the wisest human being who's ever walked on earth. He would, every, you know, at every stage of his message, before he would act, he would consult. Actually, the first thing he did after revelation came was he went and consulted Sayyidah Khadija and that has an important lesson. But also sometimes if we're in the opposite situation, okay, because it can happen. You know, your wife is always out doing some religious thing. Right? And you know, the most dangerous, you know who the most, and sorry if sisters get offended, but you know who's the most dangerous group in the Muslim community, at least in my experience of the Muslim community? And I do. Yeah, the NRAs. You know who the NRAs are? <laughs> the newly religious aunties. Right? And we have a lot of them in our community. Actually, my whole neighborhood is, is overrun by these NRAs. They're very dangerous. And I deal with a lot of flack from them because a number of them have deemed me to be deviant, which makes life fun in the neighborhood. <laughs> you know, and alhamdulillah, I don't feel bad about it because, you know, if I knew I was deviant, I'd try to get properly guided. You know, anyway, it, it, it's so. It, the opposite is also possible, right? That you know, uncle feels that auntie has gone crazy. Now, what do you do about it? A first step is, if sometimes if something if something isn't clear, one of the first things to do is to consult. Because sometimes what happens it happens a lot in the context of family. Auntie gets religious, uncle gets afraid that now life's going to be difficult, and I won't be getting any food. Because the first thing auntie learned is that women are not obligated to cook and clean, <laughs> according to the vast majority of Islamic scholarship. So auntie decides, she imagines that it's haram for me to cook and clean, right? unless he pays me for it. So anyway, so uncle gets upset, 
But the way he responds to it makes things even worse. So instead of reacting, the first thing to do, if, you know, if you're not clear how to improve things for the better, is before reacting, consult. Okay? And sometimes it might be that, or if you change the switch the table, uncle is a bit too excited about religious matters and he's always away from home. But imagine if uncle's now outside the house all the time and you react by getting mad at uncle every time he comes late, are you encouraging him to come back early next time? No, you're going to make a bad situation worse. So before reacting, it helps sometimes to consult. That, okay, how do I deal with this? In a positive way. Um, so, so that's, that's what I'm going to say. So th there's many groups in our ummah. And, there's, and the, the way to look at it is that Allah SWT has created people with different temperaments. And different people will go towards what they find to be a benefit. Right? So we should recognize the good that some people do. And, and the excesses, you know, we encourage people to avoid those excesses. Because in some cases, for example, with my, like I, tra I end up traveling quite a bit, but alhamdulillah, you know, my wife actually encourages me. She says, no, you're, what you're going to do is beautiful, it's is beautiful, it's important. So, so go. I never go for more than three weeks at a time, but I end up traveling. I used to travel more, but I think, mean, you know, you know, alhamdulillah, she's very supportive. In other situations, and, you know, for some, some other people, it can be overwhelming. So there's different situations. So. You know, people, the advice one should give is, is to consult, you know, someone's getting over exuberant, encourage them to consult you know, the, the, you know, the elders, the senior scholars in, in those groups, and they tend to typically have uh, balance. And a lot of times, this excessive energy comes from youth. And many of the early Muslims said that good will remain in people as long as they take knowledge from their elders and don't take it from the little ones amongst them. But they said that the little ones is not just in age, although it has a connotation of age, that the little ones are those lacking in understanding and wisdom. Those lacking in understanding and wisdom. Right? So you can, and normally if you ask them, what, whatever group they may be, the people who are older tend to be much more balanced than some of the young, you know, the young people who are over exuberant. Wallah Maybe another question from the sister side? We'll take both of you in order. <laughs> um, uh, so I'm kind of wondering about your opinions on this. May I? One of my frustrations with like the Muslim, American Muslim community, and sorry, I'm, you, you were talking about earlier, like how a lot of the environments that, or a lot of the events that we have aren't necessarily welcoming to everybody, and I think especially in America, like as we're struggling with our American Muslim identity, we kind of, a lot of emphasis has, has been placed on being really welcoming, but I feel like what's happened is Islam has become really watered down in a lot of these circles. And so a lot of like, you know, the really beautiful boundaries of Islam are just abandoned or compromised because we want to maintain like being welcoming. So I just kind of wanted to get your opinions about that and how to kind of how may how Islam be maintained at the same time still be welcome? And then just start just to add on to that. What also happens, I think, is when we try to have these really welcoming circles, a lot of the a lot of Muslims who want to kind of maintain boundaries are then not welcome in a way. So what about you know? So this the emphasis on being welcoming, uh, sometimes watering down the, the, the limits and so on. The uh, a lot of this returns to that idea of consulting. That that very often, you know, if you approach something with inexperience, you imagine it to be either this or that. Whereas the, the prophetic way is to break dichotomies. It's not either this or that. Should we be welcoming or should we be strict? Right. And it's neither, right? it's neither. That if you see, for example, you know, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, who's the one who established, you know, the, the, the you know, boundaries of caution and, and taqwa and so on, there's no one who is more welcoming than the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. There's no one who is more accepting than the Prophet Ali Alaihi Wasallam. So the, so the issue is how can we, you know, have 
You know, the, 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 you know, how is one welcoming? Is through husn al khuluq, through excellence of character. And you know, someone, you know, I, just very recently that struck me who was incredible in his, in his just approach, being approachable. Because I spent hours translating for him to a group of sisters, have you called him? But my wife noticed it. I noticed it partially because I was, just happened to translate. I was actually wasn't with um, Sheikh. Um, but the Sheikh from Australia was the, the main translator. But he wanted a break and said, look, this is a sister session. Give me a break. I said, okay. So Habib, the sisters fell in love with Habib Khalid because he was just so welcoming and nice. But why is that? She noticed it. You notice that he never actually made eye contact with any of the sisters. But he was so welcoming. So I asked him. He said, I look over the heads of the sisters. But he was just so, you know, the people felt that they, they felt that he reinvigorated them, that he, he gave them the time, he gave them, you know, he, he was completely at their service. Even the night that he was traveling, there's a whole group of sisters, there's a, there's a dinner, and then some sisters had a question, he stayed two hours answering the sisters' questions, till like 1.30 at night. Right? Because they had questions, and I'm at your service. But he upheld all the sunnahs related to caution and, and so on, so that there's a a way of achieving that balance, but that requires a few things. Right? That requires one consulting. Right? A, a lot of times we fail to consult, and integral in the way of the, the ulama is that when you're young, as a scholar, as a teacher, or as a leader, consult your elders. If you become one of the elders, consult those who are older than you, older not just in age but in, in experience. And then if you are the senior most of the scholars or leaders consult your peers and those younger than you. And this is one of the things we always see with the ulama, that they'll consult even their students on things. Right? And that's something that should enter into our culture, that we should be consulting those who have more experience. We should also be consulting with our peers. We should be, you know, to see how, because sometimes people do overcompensate in our community. They, they, I know situations where people have held events and the sisters have complained after that we were very uncomfortable because the shaykh was trying to be like too friendly. Like we felt very like, like you know, please, you know that there's a, there's a balance, right? But how do you do it? That you know that there needs to be an environment of consulting. Then there's also the, the reality that different people have different levels of comfort. Right? Different people have different levels of comfort, and that's part of the the diversity in our community, okay? and and that's beautiful. You know, we have in our you know, a range of legal opinions. On many things, right? there's some people. I know. Like, we, I, I'm part of a, a, a program where they have a monthly gathering, and I have a good friend of mine. He won't attend because there isn't a barrier. But if there were a barrier, another friend of mine, also in Toronto, who, another scholar said, "I won't attend if there is a barrier." And now I'm like stuck in the middle, trying to like convince the two parties that look, both of you should attend. But one saying, "I won't attend if there is a barrier," the other saying, "I." I I won't attend if there isn't. And you know, and at one level, you know, there's a range of opinions that are permitted. How, how do we deal with them? With consulting. If we are able to create situations where we're able to, to take you know different levels of comfort and so on in, in mind, then we do so. And if we can't, that's also fine. Right? There's you know, there's a broad range of opinions. Some people want to do it this way, some people want to do it that way. And it's within this broad range, that is also good. And sometimes if people do talk about things, sometimes there are situations that can be resolved. So we, there's one majlis that happens in Toronto, for example, it's a large monthly majlis, where <laughs> the masjid won't accept having a barrier. But some of the sisters really want to be behind a barrier. So what they have, on one side, there's a barrier, and some sisters sit behind the barrier. Right? And so you, you, you create those, kind, you know, those kinds of situations. And so, one thing is, with, is the consulting of one seniors. Also, there should be a process that how do we do things in our community? That they, they should be consultative processes also within the community. That how can we best take care of these, these matters? And, and those take care of most of the grievances. And, but the concern in that should be also can we address the substance of the problem rather than sometimes just its specific manifestation? Right? Um, so is it a concern that some things could be watered down? As long as they're within the, the, 
the, the, the limits of the Sharia, as defined by the, by the ulama, that there's a range. And within those range, you know, one can see where one finds you know, one's comfort. And, and, and we find, like, for example, in, in, our, in our own city in Toronto, there's all kinds of different majalis. There's some that are actually like, out there that, you know, that personally I'd never go to willingly. Like, you know, and if my wife found out that I went to them, she'd be upset. But there's people for whom those majalis are a mercy. Why? Because they're kind of, you know, they, they, they're, they've been jaded by the mainstream of the community. So we have a few, like, kind of like, sort of hippie gatherings in, in Toronto, which I've never encouraged people to go to. But there's some people who end up going to them, who is it's not almost like halfway house, right? Yeah, they sort of help them reconnect. They get, they get comfortable again with the dean. And they serve really nice tea and this and that. And then they, they're, they're willing to... To come back and actually, the, the sheikh who runs one of these, he told me, "Look, I, you know what I run is like a is like a mental asylum, <laughs> right?" And he knows he, he, he's, he's a very noble man. So look, I don't like exactly how things are done in our majlis, but I'm dealing, you know, we're crazy, <laughs> right? and you know, I disagree, I disagree with him, but he's not. He didn't ask me my opinion, so I didn't tell him what I felt about it. So you know, there, there's a wisdom in it too. You know, if you go even, like one of the things that used to fascinate me in Damascus when I was there was that all these strange people used to come to Damascus and go and do really weird things, Westerners, at the grave of Ibn Arabi. I ended up, Imam Zayn used to actually sit there studying, so sometimes to go and, and study there too. But there's certain times that I'd hide from Imam Zayn because after Asr, Imam Zayn would want to, to do some group liquor together. And I wanted to use that time to study. So if I was there at Asr, I'd spend 10-15 minutes hiding from Imam Zayn so that he'd, he'd do his group liquor, I'd, I'd study some fiqh, and then go and greet Imam Zayn. And you'd find all kinds of weird Westerners coming, doing strange things. And it's wrong, some of the things they're doing are really wacky. But it served as a halfway house. And many things in our community are like that. that you know, because we're, we're not there to run the world, right? People are going to do what they're going to do. And you kind of... You have to let them be. And a man came to the Prophet ﷺ. And this hadith is so shocking, right, that some people said, some of the hadith scholars said that this couldn't be sahih. But it is. A man came, right, this, it, within family. A man came and said, Ya Rasulullah, inna, inna mra'ati la taruddu yada lamis. That, oh, Messenger of Allah, my wife does not turn away seeking hands. And it means exactly what it sounds like. The Prophet ﷺ asked him, that would you divorce her? And the man, in one direction, the man didn't say anything. It was obvious that he wouldn't. In another, it says, and there's the discussion as to whether he said it or this is what was understood from him. But the man clearly didn't want to divorce her. So he asked him, do you, do, do you love her? And the man indicated that he, that he did. So he said, then enjoy her company. Like, what are you going to do about it? Like, you're going to tie her down, lock her up, do this? Like, there's, you have two choices. Either leave her, or you make it work out. Right? And sometimes, you know, we can't, we're not running the world. We're not running other people's lives. Right? And people have their struggles, their understandings, etc. Like, what are you gonna you, what are you gonna do about it? And this is a constant theme in, in, in the life of the Prophet, even in our relationship. We can't force other people to change. Uh, the, this companion came, we committed zina with someone's neighbor, then with someone someone else's neighbor, then with someone else's neighbor, and he was punished each time. And finally, some of the Sahaba were, were, were like talking badly about him. The Prophet said, Ma, la tu'inu shaytanahu alayhi. Stop. Don't assist his shaytan against him. Let the man struggling. You know, let, let him be. Let, let him be. It'll take him time. Okay? And, you know, they say that's at the level of individual relation, but also in the community. I was in, in Indonesia a few years ago, and there's a few things that I saw in, in, in Indonesia that I haven't seen anywhere else in the Muslim world. So I asked one of the scholars from the Habayib there, from you know, the, the Ba'alawi tradition. And he said, they have certain cultural practices that we don't entirely agree with. He says, but they're still new to Islam. Islam's only been here for about three centuries. Three centuries! And, you know, we, we think that you know, Islam's been in North America for how long? And it's like, we're the second generation. Khalas, everyone should be like... He's like, Islam's still new here. It'll take them time. Right? And, and some change takes, and that's how change came in history, right? So, you know, so we should find, 
you know, we should ask our hearts what we consider to be correct, and we should follow it, and as a community, we should try to come to a beautiful balance that takes into account a range of practice, and we should be soft-headed as well, right? Not to, not to, to be hard-headed on one position that we say that it has to be this way or no other way. But sometimes also, if one is genuinely not comfortable with something, then, you know, one doesn't have to attend every gathering, and that doesn't have to be at everything that happens, either because we find it too, you know, too easy going, or one finds it too uncomfortably strict or whatever. Okay? And there's a range, there's a, there's a beautiful diversity in that as well. Allah for that answer. Uh, Sister Mona, uh, and, and if I might, just in the interest of time, after yes. after you, after you will switch to the men's side. You can make it very brief. I'm, I'm just wondering, my son is uh, still a teenager, and he's very much involved in the MSA. So what advice would you give the youth to look out for when other people try to join the MSA? You don't really know their backgrounds. They may seem very friendly, but they may have this violent streak within them. What kind of signs do you look for one should be aware of? To, to watch out and not be in their company, because if they are indeed misguided, they're not going to walk around, you know, wearing it on their face, right? So what, what kind of advice would you give kids to to look out for? What's... Um, I, so I guess I'll come to but um, I wanted to say something about what you were saying before. Um, you know, this, this is um, kind of a problem that we have, I think, that we don't really know how to uh, kind of forgive when things happen. In the community, sometimes you were mentioning about people kind of finding their place in halfway houses. It's a good analogy. To know. I think part of the issue that we have, though, is that we can't. We don't, we have um, religion, Islam is a religion that's intact, meaning that we have this thing where the Quran and the Sunnah, the tradition, the the whole body of it is literally intact. It's not something you find around the world, you know. The other religions that if there whatever's left of them is not there's no chain, and so we have this kind of double-edged sword where we can't make things up as we go along because there's too much proof against us if we do so. And thank God. And the other thing is that we have such strong ideals about the way things are supposed to be that we can find it to be crippling in the world that we live in. Meaning that um, the bar has been set so high. And the tradition has been so well defined and, and saved all the way to this day, may Allah preserve it to the last day. Um, but at the same token, there's this little problem that's been happening all the way through, and there's these human beings that have to like, live it, and it's never consistent. You know? And so what happens with us is that we, especially when you read an analogy about like, new Muslims and stuff like that, like, we start to practice and or something like that, start studying, whatever, and we're getting introduced to these ideals. And we, and we just seem to think that, well, okay, I am that ideal. And then here we go, I'm perfect. And people that don't seem to be, I, I heard Dr. Jackson call this the Abu Bakrization of Umar, <laughs> where everybody becomes Abu Bakr. You know, if you're not Abu Bakr, then you're not welcome. That kind of a problem. And I think the deeper problem is that, or no, the, I think what we need to really ask ourselves is that are we prepared to forgive each other for things? You know, are we, are we prepared to forgive each other for our humanity? If someone doesn't, Pray the way that I do. Just forgive them. Right? If someone doesn't uh, doesn't seem to be as pious as I am, just forgive them. You know? um, if someone is not, uh, I don't know, doesn't see eye to eye with me. In other words, first of all, maybe you shouldn't think that you know everything or that you have everything the way that it should be yourself. But if you do, just have it in your heart to like kind of let it go and forgive them. I think that's a real big problem that we have. And so people can't make mistakes. And they're really afraid to make mistakes. If they, ever, if they ever make a mistake, they just do everything they can to make sure that nobody finds out. It's like such a, come on, man. Like, you know, there's this thing called Tawbah. You know, there's this thing called Tawah. There's this thing called Mahabha. There's this thing called, I remember Sheikh Hamza said a long time ago something really beautiful. I mean, he says a lot of things like that. May Allah preserve him. But he said, he said, you know, that when my relatives, he said, when my relatives leave this world, he said, they're no longer my relatives. When they're buried in the ground. I mean, he, he said it, whatever he meant by that. When they're, when they're in the ground, he said, there's no longer a relationship between I and them because of this thing called Iman. <laughs> God will deal with them in a certain way, but he doesn't deal with people who believe. I mean, he said that. I don't know if you take it back now. But it's important to understand what he was saying at the time, and that's that. But when it comes to people that are praying next to me, those are my brothers and sisters. Those are my, when you say auntie, it's like, no, really, that's your mom's sister. You know? And it kind of, I mean, I wonder, are, 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 
are, are the families like this? I think those were all no one can forgive. Is it, is, that, is it like that in the families as well? So I'm just like, okay, you know, we're human beings and this is our need. It is intact. We do have to hold it up. We have to, we have to hold this thing up called mercy. You know, and we have to forgive each other. I want to be able to know that I can fall on my face. I need to know that I can fall on my face and look ridiculous. Totally ridiculous. And I'll dust myself off and, and the Muslims are going to embrace me and say, Alhamdulillah. I don't want to have the feeling that I make a mistake and I have to start considering Buddhism. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm serious. I mean, I, I'm really, I mean, I wish it was, I can laugh, it's just true. People are leaving this land because, you know, Buddhists don't judge or whatever. <laughs> but I mean, that's not, that's just, like we, you know, we, we have to be able to dig deeper into ourselves and be able to be really human about this thing. Because people are just looking for humanity, they just want to see a human being. I want to know that, like, if I make a mistake, you're not gonna. I'm not gonna be, you know, relegated to the gutter for the rest of my life. These kinds of things, you know. And in terms of like your the, the child and so, uh, children, as they might say, and something like that, I think I had a, you're, you're a mother, I think. Yes, I am. Yeah, I hear you with your voice. You know, that's beautiful. But I'm here to tell you uh, that your child is gonna be facing stuff that they won't even tell you about. You know, and. What's what's more important? I don't I don't think it's it's so important to be able to kind of fend oneself off from dangerous things as much as it is to be able to deal with them once they've happened. Um, and like the same thing with the problems that that we have, like people are going to sin, people are going to make mistakes, they're going to fall down. Fine, whatever. It's not a matter of like you know this whole sins and mistakes kind of a thing, or bad people, good people. It's not a matter of. How do I avoid it? It's impossible to avoid this world is bad. This world is trial. But the problem is, the question is, when it happens, and it's gonna happen, is my child able to deal with it, to bounce back from it? Can they operate in the world? You know what I mean? So um, in that way, you know, I think it's important. I mean, I'm, I think it's really very important that um, that our children, our young people, have some elasticity. Like we're very like kind of like glass people. You know, we need to be we need more have some elasticity. You know, dangerous people are around. <laughs> they are actually. It's a lot of people. If you ever take the train anywhere, you realize how dangerous it gets. Yeah. So, you know, if you've never taken the train, you just get on the train. You'll see. You'll be like, you know, you got your iPad or whatever. What, the sentiment that happens a lot of times is that we just want to kind of be safe from every kind of evil and just be in our bubble. <laughs> but the truth is that God has placed us in the thick of it. Muslims are here for a reason. We're not here to, to be pristine and just kind of, we're actually here to be right in the middle of it. You know, Mecca, I mean, Islam is an urban religion, right in the middle of it. Because we, we have to be, able, and we need to have some elasticity to be able to, to deal and to manage. Uh, so that, you know, there's, I'll say there's one last thing. You guys, have you guys ever heard of this thing called YouTube? You ever heard of YouTube? Yeah, that's pretty cool. YouTube has like these videos that are free. I watch it all the time, I can't lie. <laughs> um, there's this uh, a video I saw of a guy, you might have seen this. Uh, this guy comes in, he wants to rob this Muslim guy's store. So he comes in to rob the store, you might have seen it. He comes in to rob the store, Muslim guy turns around and has a gun. You know, Muslim, but no, the guy, Muslim guy takes his gun. You didn't expect that, you know? Mm. He's like, like a daisy, he kind of just, you know, just a nice guy, you know, turned around, man, Rambo just grabs the gun, puts it back on him, like, what's up now, you know? And the guy's like, ah, oh, okay, this is not what they expected. So, he's like, the guy, the guy kind of gets down on his knees and he's like begging for his life now. He's like, look, I just want to feed my family. So the Muslim, the Muslim guy, look at, the, look, look at the elasticity. It's not just elasticity, it's like, it's just straight power. I mean, I was like, is this real, man? Like, you know, like, why, you, 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 you hope this is real. Like, obviously it was. He says, um, he says to the guy, he says, um, he starts talking to him. He has a gun still at him, right? He just to let him know, like, don't mess around. I still have a gun. He's talking to him. He's kind of giving him counseling now. He's like, I just wanted to, I just, I just want to feed my family. He starts talking to him about, you know, about goodness and these kinds of things. And the guy's just like, man, I don't know what you're about, but I just want to be like you. This, this is on tape. If I had the link, I'd give it to you, but I don't have it, but. So anyway, he says, you want to be like me? He's like, yeah, he says, say ashadu. Ashadu, Allah, Allah, ilah, he, got, he has a gun in his face. <laughs> he has a gun in his face, but he's giving him shahada. 
<laughs> I mean, it's the most amazing. Like this is this is what I'm, this is Islam. Like this is what it does. Flip, I'm talking about flip the script. You know, just oh, I have the gun. You do what I say. I'm going to rob you of your kufr. If, if it was never there, I don't know. And so you know, and this guy walks out of this place in Muslim. And then oh, on top of that, push the gun down finally. After he takes the he puts the gun down like cool around the same side now. <laughs> so he, he gives him uh, he gives him some cash. He's like, here, he doesn't throw it at him like, there you go, no Muslim, you know. He goes, here, you know, take care of yourself. The guy goes off like crying. It's a beautiful video, it's real. I mean, I'm not saying that uh, that maybe you know your children should learn how to flip guns around at people, or, which would be really cool. If it happens, make sure they do film it. Right? <laughs> but 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 we need to be like this. That God has put us here for a reason. You know, it's not like save ourselves from the dirty people. No, it's more like this man was a washing machine. You know? And <laughs> there you have it. I don't know. I'll, I'll just with one brief point because you're carrying mm -hmm. something very close to my heart. Um, there, the you know the central concept related to parenting. And there's three terms used in terms of the religious upbringing of a child. And there's the idea of terbiyah, which is raising one's child. There's a notion of ta'deem. And there's a notion of ta'deem, teaching them. The central operative principle in raising one's children is what's called ta'deem. And ta'deem can be understood in a negative way as simply disciplining. In the sense of that you serve as a, the parent as policeman. Okay? That don't do this, don't do that, stay away from those people, don't do this, you have to do this. Like, you know, you're some kind of like the traffic police and, you know, and the parking police all in one. Worse than that is when his parent is judge. You are wrong, you are wrong, guilty as charged, right? But what is the deep, our sense of, you know, the active role of a parent in correcting the child, in disciplining the child? Disciplining is not about punishing or correcting the mistakes of the child, but rather ta'deem is the instilling of adab in the child. Now what is adab? The so Allah define adab in different ways, but adab is the capacity, it is, an, is having the capacity and concern. And adab itself is the capacity and concern to manifest the right attitude, action, and response to the actions of others, given circumstances. Okay, so Adam, an important definition, is to have the capacity and the concern to, to, to manifest the right attitude, the right action, and the right response to the actions of others, given the circumstances. So when we are parenting, what we, what we're not trying to do is to give children a manual. 10 things to do, 11 things not to do, or 21 things not to do, and now stick to this. But rather, when we tell our children what we tell them, when we correct our children, we are trying to instill in them that capacity. The deem is, is the instilling of that, what very often is referred to as intrinsic motivation. The test of it is that were you not to tell the child what to do, they would do the right thing. And they would do the right thing. They would know what to do. Okay. So the test of parenting in those situations is the child should already be ready, and we see very clearly in the prophetic way of upbringing that we that we ready our children before they are responsible. We give them the capacity before they're in the particular situation where they'll be tested. So we encourage our children to pray from when they're seven, even though they won't be morally responsible till they're till they're twelve. So I used to tell my kid, you know, my, my older son, his name's Omar, and he's sort of Omari. Like he'll just and we have to actually tell him, calm down, like just you know, chill out. Because he gets really upset if anything's wrong around him. And he's he's recognizing. But number two, his name's Farid, and he's kind of unique. Okay? So like, ask Farid, when he was six, I'd ask him, Farid, have you prayed Isha? He said, no. He said, pray. He said, oh, Abuji, I don't have to. And you don't really need, and with complete respect to that, and you don't need to tell me, because you don't have to encourage me until I'm seven. 
And you know, and that's true. <laughs> you know, so what do, but of course the winning argument would be, I'd ask him, what would the Sahaba do? Once I actually were having this conversation, I repeated itself several times. I, what would the Sahaba do? And he actually jumped up on the bed and he realized that he wasn't facing the Qibla, so he spun towards the Qibla and said, Allah what but then he realized he was on the bed. So he took two steps, he jumped off the bed and continued his prayer. We ought to make it dramatic then. We ought to pray right away. But we need to instill that confidence in our child, right? So that when they're at university, etc., that we should give them that strength of faith and that religious concern, that we don't need to be defensive with our children. Right? That they can walk with their own two feet in this world, and we're not concerned that they will make the wrong choice. Of course, we have to be there and supportive of them, right? Because we, the prophetic way is not to be defensive, right? And you know, if you have a siege mentality, see, sieges typically collapse. Okay? So when we're in situations where we feel that, you know, that the, the faith and practice of our children may be tested, we need to instill stronger faith and, and practice in our children. Right? So that we don't just have like, you know, minimalistic children that, well, they're, they're good Muslims, they, they pray five times a day. Right? Alhamdulillah, I know children, and I've seen them in the Muslim world, I, I, I see them in my own community in North America, I, I know them in my own family. Children who are seven and eight who, who pray to Hajj. Who do daily awrad. Right? I was visiting one of my relatives, and this kid in the family is only like eight or nine. He was in timeout on, on the stairs, and he gets into timeout and he starts praying. <laughs> and he was making God. So I, I went up the stairs, and I don't like movement, so it was a big thing for me to go up the stairs. I said, Why are you praying? <laughs> so, you know, I'm the oldest kid, and mom always like punishes me. And you know, like there's only so much I can complain. So all I can do is turn and he's like crying. So all I can do is turn to Allah. So we'll say, what did you pray? I pray Salat al Hajj. That Allah inspired mom to be a little more understanding of my situation. <laughs> and it was beautiful, right? We said like but she won't listen. So there's only so much you can say to mom. So what what is the solution? That he was praying Salat al Hajj. I asked him, who told you to do this? He said, Well I've read about Salat al Hajj. Hmm. Right? But we need to instill that, you know, if you, one thing, if you, you know, a book that all of us should read, you know, is a, is a 40 Nawawi. And many of the ulama would say that you should read the, even if you're a scholar, you should read the 40 Nawawi at least once a month. Just have a routine once a month, put it in your calendar once a month, review the 40 Nawawi. If you go through the 40 Nawawi, you'll be shocked at the number of the hadiths in the 40 Nawawi that are advices, the advice of the Prophet gave to children. And they're not simple advices. Actually, pretty much most of the most of the hadiths are in, in the Quran that the Prophet advised someone. It was to children. The hadith of Ibn Abbas, he was behind the Prophet ﷺ. The Prophet ﷺ said to him, "Yeah, that oh, oh young oh young boy, I'll teach you some words." Be mindful of Allah and Allah will be mindful of you. Be mindful of Allah and you'll find him before you. And the hadith continues. That's advice to like a 10, 11 year old. One of the central hadiths, and this even this blew me away because like, you know, my primary interest in Islam, in Islamic science is fiqh. One of the central hadiths in the, you know, in the prophetic teachings when it comes to, to, to fiqh is the hadith of Al-Halal Al-Bayyin wa Al-Haram Al-Bayyin. Who narrated this hadith? It was narrated by An-Nu'man ibn Bashir. And he says in the hadith, Sami'atu Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I heard the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam say. And that word, that expression there is very important. Why? Hmm? Because he was young. How old was he when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa passed away? He was less than eight. Because An-Nu'man ibn Bashir was the first person born to the Ansar, the people of Medina when the Prophet ﷺ migrated. And he was born 14 months after the Prophet ﷺ migrated. And his mother brought him to the Prophet ﷺ to do tahnik, to, you know, to, to take the date and rub it on him. And when the Prophet ﷺ passed away, he was less than eight. He heard this hadith when he was six or seven. And he narrated the hadith. And it's a deep hadith. All, they say, many of the fuqaha said, all the, the, the principles of Islamic law can be deduced from that hadith, 
as well as its spiritual spiritual purpose. And the path of how you practice spirituality is understood from this hadith. It is one of the most encompassing hadith. The Prophet amongst the, the people who were being addressed by this and who understood this was a six or seven year old. Right? And many, many other hadiths, the hadith of Abdullah bin Umar and others. So, you know, we should see how we can instill in our children a high standard of maturity. That children are born with the capacity of, that we make them dumb. Right? We make them dumb. Right? That we should take that seriously. It, it's, my, my, my wife notices it more, but I realized it. Very often you go to Islamic programs, and there's like 10, 12 year old kids, often older, and what are they doing? Their parents give them an iPad, so you know, the, the shape's talking about something, they're sitting there playing a game. Okay? Um, or, you know, and these are people who are coming to the religious program, let alone those who don't. Right? We should hold our children to a higher standard so that they, won't, don't, they don't want to do foolish things. And they don't want to do foolish things. Um, and then, if they have that clarity, they'll be able to walk in this life with confidence. And, but we shouldn't sell our children short. That, you know, if we think that the deen is worth it, then you know, we should raise children who feel that the deen is worth it. And they'll, and they'll, you know, they'll stick to it. And that's possible wherever you are in the world. Right? It's, it's very possible. SubhanAllah. It's time to go to the brother's side. So, brothers, fire away. <laughs> yes, Assalamu alaikum. The, the way I, I think we and our Muslim, I don't want to say myself and our children growing in this country, uh, many are dissolved in the society. We have to protect them from the society here. There was survey a long time ago. We have distributed in this much. It's, it's, it's very serious. 45% of the Muslim students going to college are alcoholic. So my thinking about protecting the kids from the developing this. I have experience in this country. I have seen how the children growing in this country are very open, very, very open. In a school where we have 200 students in 1980, I'm talking about, when I talk about the Mirad and Nabi, one student got up and said, are these fairy tales? And we should listen to them. We cannot stop beating like India, Pakistan, something happened. We have to explain to them what is Mirat. So what I'm saying, we have to teach them the basics of Islam. What did Islam means? When Islam started? How the Islam, what is the meaning of Islam? Who is a Muslim? This is not happening. We have become very educational, institutional, but the basic principle we have to teach them, I mean, it's my observation, to tell them about when Islam started, what the meaning of Islam, and how we practice Islam, who is our, uh, the last prophet, and who are all the prophets before them, they were Muslims. So these are the things, can you uh, so suggest the, something? The, the sort of faith crisis in, in the community, right? and I mean, it, it returns to, I mean, there, people need to have access to, to knowledge, right? But they also need to be inspired in that knowledge, right? It's not enough just, and a lot of these, a lot of young kids, and I, you know, I don't, you know, I have certain life commitments, and these commitments were made by my Hanifa, that, you know, I don't teach Arabic, I don't teach Quran, I don't teach a bunch of things. Um, I try to focus on fiqh. But one of the realizations that a lot of kids who are who, who end up drifting is not you know, people don't drift because they say, "I don't believe this." They drift above all because of a lack of faith, and that that faith either weakens or it was never nurtured in the first place, or it wasn't rooted. It wasn't grounded in understanding and nourished through 
spirituality and inspiration. Right? So the, one aspect of it has to do with knowledge. But the, the nature of our religion is that it doesn't it's not so much about knowledge itself. Right? It's not so much about knowledge itself that you need to root guidance in the heart. And you need to root guidance in the heart. And to do that, right, we need to, to really have that in comprehensive concern, right? And one aspect of it it has to look at. And we, we look at it positively, right? That here, the people who are here, all of us could be reaching out, whether to be youth. There's elders in our community. I have I know in our my own circle of family and you know my father's friends, etc., uncle types who are having crises of faith now that they have retired, who are going into depression because everything they believed in no longer makes sense. And they're really like, you know, they're really confused. And, you know, my father, who's, you know, he says, you know, I have to give people counseling on faith when I never thought myself to be, you know, a serious believer. Although, mashallah, you know, he is a serious believer, but he never thinks himself as such. But, you know, there's, there's all kinds of people who are lacking that light. So we should look at it as a... It's an incredible opportunity right, that we we can we can do something for ourselves, right? To, to, to help, you know, to either guide or facilitate guidance. But what it requires, it begins with ourselves. Right? They say, The one who doesn't have something cannot give it. And one of the beautiful things of the the Islamic tradition is that the, the manifestation of the Prophet's word that this religion is ease is manifest even in the way the religion is taught. That you can have clear understanding of is Islamic beliefs just by, you don't have to read books and books and books. The text, the ulama, took away so much difficulty. The author text that if someone, if they're diligent, they study a basic text over four or five classes, and they study one more text just over 10, 12 classes, they'll have, you know, a sound understanding of, of Islamic beliefs. And if they have maturity and so on, they could explain it to someone else. One of the beautiful things you see in many cities in the Muslim world, and I used to see it regularly in Damascus, but I used to pass by that masjid on almost a daily basis, Jamia Zayd bin Thabit in Damascus. You go there any time of the day, except like late at night, and there'll always be little kids teaching littler kids. Right? Because they just made it a system, and you see it in other places as well. Kids who are 10 or 11 would be teaching kids who are 7 or 8. Because right, if they studied two texts, they'd, they'd be teaching people who are studying their first text. Right? Right? And, but we have to sit down and see, okay, like almost like do, a, a, you know, do studies in our community. Okay, we are in the MCC. This is the, this is the broad range of our potential reach. How many Muslims are there? Who are, what's their demographic? How can we reach them? What are other masajid as well with whom we can have relations so that we can, have, we can be assisting one another? Because someone may have a scholar who can teach Quran. We, you know, it's how we can synergize our resources. Uh, who do we have in our community? What do we need to do to empower the members of our community to be able to reach the various demographics? There's children in, you know, there's these number of high schools in the area. There's Muslims there. There's a number of school, people in primary school. How can we, you know, like to, to, to really sit down and see, okay, this is, these are the Muslims in our area. How can we reach them? What would we need to reach them? And we were like, okay, you know what? We don't have enough Quran teachers. We can sit back and say, okay, Allah grant us Quran teachers. Right? No. Right? Right? You say, Man and wajib. And whoever seeks something and then they strive for it will find it. Right? So we have to sit down and come up with strategy. How do we deal with these problems? What, what, what would it require? It, it requires, okay, we need a lot more teachers of religion who are grounded, what would it take? We need to make some investments in that, so five years down the road, ten years down the road, we'll have them. What would it take? Right? And to build up to that, to come up with a strategic plan as a community, that how will we address this broader challenge? Right? And not to look at it, because if we approach it that we are under siege here in North America and people are falling out, if we look at it defeated, we've lost already. But the, the, the way of the Prophet in everything, even in the worldly challenges, he was positive, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, right? Once all he had to eat, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, was dry bread and leftover vinegar. And the Sahaba who were sitting with him, none of them had anything else to give him. But he smiled and said, Ni'mal idamul khal. What a wonderful sauce is vinegar. 
And they said the, the vinegar, this was stale leftover vinegar. You, you, the Arabs wouldn't even call it vinegar. It had many names for, you know, the, the leftover vinegar at the end. But he called it with, he called it vinegar, even though it was stale leftover, right? And the bread was dry. Right? And similarly, in the Meccan phase, when they were opposed and oppressed and so on, he spoke with confidence that, that one day Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will spread this message, you know, to Sham and so on. And all, so many times he talked about that to his companions. Why? Because the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is true. Right? What we have to do is, is to, to live up to it. Right? And see, this is a tremendous opportunity. You can, you know, if you learn a little and live it with sincerity, connect with scholars, and seek their advice and be guided, and you do it with that concern, then we have a responsibility right, to the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, who conveyed it, to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who has made us responsible for it. None of you believes until they wish for others of the good as they wish for it themselves. But in the prophetic way, which is not just to go and people to start teaching people just whatever they've understood, but in a proper way. Connect with scholars. And you're blessed in the Bay Area, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will ask us about our blessings. He has blessed us in the, in, in the Bay Area with some of the most learned and the most beautiful scholars, male and female, right? That we have no excuse not to take up that challenge, right? We should be, but we should have a strategy, like seriously, a broad encompass right? How will we address this, this challenge? How will we live up to this opportunity? Because if we were to ask right now, okay, who can go and give khutbas in the high schools? People will say, oh, I'm not ready. I'm this is, a, you know, this is a responsibility, right? We see that that's an opportunity. Who can go and start some halakas for the sisters who are, you know, who are in high school and they're showing interest in deen? Who's ready to do that? They say, well, why aren't there female scholars? No, right? Be one of them. Now, you don't have to become a sheikha, but learn something, be ready to teach it, and be in connection with scholars who are connected, and so that they can say yes. Now. You can do it. And you, and you do it seeking the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala with the concern of service. Okay? So it is a big challenge, but we should see it as a tremendous opportunity that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala can use us in the way He's used the messengers in the foremost of His creation. That Allah guides through you one person is better for you, the Prophet said to Sayyidina Ali, than the world and all it contains. And we have that opportunity here. Right? So uh, you know, we should make the most of it. And with that, you, you, Every land that Islam entered in, Islam was preserved. It was preserved. And that's, you know, that's something that you know, we have to be, you know, we have to do our part in doing that. Allah. But this is not happening in al Masai. <laughs> no, it, it's, I mean, it's easy to look at it in a dark way, right? In a dark way, that there's so many failures, right? There's so many failures. So, but the prophetic way is to, to be conscious of our shortcomings, but it's also important to, to remember the successes, right? That, and one of the things, and if people who are serious about it should consider this, that it's very important to document successes as well. The, 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 the Prophet Sallallahu one of the great imams of the spiritual path, Sahil ibn Abdullah, to study, he says something, really, he said, At-tawakkulu halu Rasulillahi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, wal-akhdu bil-asbari sunnatu. And this is mentioned by Imam al Bushaini, it's mentioned by Imam al Bayhaqi in the Shu'ab al Iman and, and others that reliance on Allah was the state of the Messenger of Allah and the taking of means was his example. So whoever would seek to have his state or would claim his state, let them hold fast to his example. What was the example? His example was taking the means, taking the best of means and the best of ways. And if one does that, then success is a promise from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you can say that, well, we don't have many youths coming in our masajid. But the question to ask is not that, is that are we, are we following the best practices by which we would engage youth in our communities? And I know there's a number of communities, and I can mention some if you know, people want to see those examples, but where people made strategic investments. One of them is the Canton Mosque. And dear friend of many of us, see they see a Safi, he you know, he, he was the the, the 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 youth counselor there. They realized that they, they have potential to reach many youth, but they weren't coming to the masjid. What did they do? Instead of just building bigger physical structures, they invested in a initially in a part-time youth counselor. 
But so many of you started coming, they hired them full time. But then they realized there's so many people coming and so many men and women, they hired a full time female youth counselor. But they invested in their youth. They gave the basement of the message to the youth. They gave them a budget. And these are from best practice, how we reach youth. So youth have a budget. They decide how to spend the money. They just have to get it approved, but they decide how they spend that money on youth programming. And every time I go to the Canton Mosque, there's youth like bursting from the seams, other massages. If we follow best practices, we can expect right results. Right? If we don't take the right means, and you say, well, where are the results? Right? It's kind of obvious. And part of it, though, is that, you know, the, 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 the positive way is to see, okay, how can we as a community gather that wisdom? Gather that wisdom. That across North America, there are many, many beautiful practices. There are many masajid where a lot of youth come out. Okay? Actually, some masajid where I know some of the, the imams there, they're kind of worried that these youth, you know, they should spend more time at home. Because they're just hanging out at the masjid. There's one masjid on the East Coast, I won't mention which, because some of you might identify the person. This auntie, she kept giving me a hard time. I was there for three days at that, at that masjid. She says, Beta, please tell these young men to stop bouncing these balls in the house of Allah. It creates a ruckus. Because anytime you'd be at the masjid, there'd be all these youth there playing basketball. Because they have like several basketball courts. <laughs> okay. Just please tell them to stop bouncing balls in the house of Allah. I know. And I thought the wonderful thing is all these youth at the masjid. But they've created that right atmosphere, right? So part of it is, is that to look at what are people doing right and to build upon that. The Prophet when he came, and I'm going to close with this, but when he came to Mecca, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala described the state. Yet at that time, that ظهر الفساد في البر والبحر بما كسبت أيدي الناس That corruption has spread right, in the oceans and in the lands by what the hands of men have wrought. Yet when the Prophet ﷺ himself dis defined his mission, he did not define it in a negative way. That I have come to dispel darkness. And to, he said, إِنَّمَا بُعِثُ لِأُتَمِّمَ مَكَارِمَ الْأَخْلَاقِ I was only sent to complete nobility of character. He recognized the good that people had. And he recognized that they were falling short of their potential. So he saw that his message was to complete the good that they had and the potential for good that they had. So similarly, we can look at our community and become despondent and desperate. That so many things are messed up. But then, look in another way. How many other communities in such a short period of time have managed to establish as many institutions as the Muslim community has. Look at how many masajid have been built right, who studied the deen and came back from the generation after our great leaders of you know, Sheikh Hamza, Imam Zayd, etc. We have people who studied the deen right here in the Bay Area and who are now teaching across the world like Ustaz Abdul Latif. Right? That, you know, and it's how long has it taken to happen? So there's many, many successes, right? So we should learn Right? Okay, like, look, all, what are the good things that are happening? Right? And how can we benefit from the other good things that are happening, the best practices? Right? And have a thing of, let's you know, keep going forward. Because right? if we stop and look back at every, imagine if the Prophet ﷺ sat with the companion and said, look at everything that's wrong in Mecca. Right? Like, let's give up. Let's just go to a cave and get back to worship. No, right? that's not, the, you don't look back. Like, if you're climbing a mountain, if you look down, you're going to fall. Right? So that's why you know it's steep and there's all kinds of terrible things happening. There's amazing things happening. People are becoming Muslim in the weirdest of ways. Right? I mean, just you know, just this Monday we should all pray for you know, a pure soul. I gave Shahada through Facebook. I don't know if you guys even know Facebook has a chat service. Right? There's this girl from a Hindu family, Imam Afroz and I met her in Perth. I said she was really Imam Afroz, myself, and Sheikh Yahya, but Sheikh Yahya avoids the internet. So Imam Afroz and I did the follow-up. And she was really moved by the program that the three of us did in Perth. And she started asking questions. And Hunter, you know, last Monday, she, she asked me, she messaged me online and said, how do I give the shahada? I said, well, it's simple, you know. Um, I said, first, you know, you should realize that you're probably already a Muslim. Right? Because one thing that's important, it actually helps a lot when we're dealing with, with people who are considering Islam, that when someone accepts Belief in God, you know, belief in Allah, and accepts that the Prophet is a messenger of Allah and accepts his guidance, between them and Allah, they're already a Muslim. The shahada is for them to be recognized as a Muslim in this world of life. 
Right? But how would we know that Bill is a Muslim? Because he said that he declared that he is. But between them and Allah, once they've, you know, once they've had that belief, they are Muslim. He says, yeah, but how do I say the shahada? I say, well, you, know, you go, you, know, you tell another Muslim, yeah, this testification of faith. So. He says, so can I do it any time? So I said, well, you can do it now, or you can go tell one, you know, one of your friends. I didn't tell him more, but what I meant by do it now? He says, so you mean I can do it like right now? I said, yeah, it's possible. He said, how? So I can, I can just call you on Facebook. Or you can go talk to one of your friends. I said, how do you call me on Facebook? He said, will you give me permission? I said, yeah. So you want to give the shahada? I said, yeah. So I called her right then. She gave me permission. I said, so how do you call me? I said, it's called Facebook chat, right? There's a calling function. It's free. She was in Australia. I called her. I gave her the shahada. And, and she asked, what do I do next? And it's very simple, right? Um, I said, have you seen Muslim make wudu? I said, yeah. They just do what they do. You wash your face, your arms, wipe the middle of your head, wash both feet. That's it. And then how do you pray? You, you know the movements of prayer? Yes, just say Allah Akbar in each of the movements. And what, what do you close? with? said, as alaykum. So yeah, that's it. That's the prayer. Well, that's the Hanabi prayer. <laughs> uh, and that's it, right? People have become Muslim in all kinds of weird There's a lot of good going on, right? So the, the Sunnah is that to recognize that good and ask for increase while being aware of the challenges, etc., but not to fo- not to fixate on, on, on the darkness, right? Not to fixate on the darkness, right? And, and those who take the right means, right? When I was rich, I came back in 2007, I was over six or ten years. I asked one of my teachers, he asked me, was, he saw I was a bit hesitant. He asked him, should I go back or not? And he said something very profound. And it should fill us all with hope. You know, I said, well, I'm fine with going back, but my only concern is my children. And he smiled. Right? And he's one of the great spiritual luminaries of our time. He smiled and says, my experience in life has been, and he's dealt with people from all over the world, etc. He's a you know, spiritual guy. He said, my experience has been that if your state with Allah is good, and you raise your children in a good way, you should be expectant of good results wherever you are. If your state with Allah is not good, and you don't raise your children in a good way, then you shouldn't be surprised at the worst of things happening. And the same thing you know, applies you know, in other relationships as well. If we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, that He make us of those whose hearts are filled with hope. Right? But what is hope? Hope is seeking high matters, and then taking the means of attaining them. And that we realize that the giver is ever living. And that if we seek the best of matters with the best of intent, in the best of ways, to the best of our abilities, and our, we place our trust and confidence in Allah, that He does not let down anyone who places his trust in Him truly. وآخر دعوانا أن الحمد لله رب العالمين